So I'd like to welcome each and every one of you this evening. And uh, on behalf of the Old Bristol Historical Society and on behalf of myself, Bob Ives, I'd like to not only welcome you, but thank you all very, very much for coming to this second talk in our series of five talks about the history of Bristol and the history of Maine in general. So tonight we're very, very pleased and honored to have with us Joe Hall, Professor Joseph Hall of Bates College. Joe was raised in Newport, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and then made his way to a place called Amherst College in Massachusetts, where he did his BA, and then on to the University of Wisconsin in Madison for his master's and PhD in history. So Joe is a professor, associate professor at Bates College in the Department of History and Environmental Studies. And I want to tell you, if you were a student, I think you would really enjoy having all of his classes, or at least I would especially enjoy having any of the classes that he teaches. He teaches in environmental studies, he teaches colonial American history, he teaches the history of slavery, the history of African American people, the history of Native American history, and also, probably from whence this talk is derived, he teaches a class in the history of Maine Native Americans, the Webb Mackeys in particular, including the tribes of the Passamaquoddies, the Penobscots, the Micmacs, the Maliseets, the Etchemins, all the different tribes in this area. And that is the genesis for his talk tonight on how names suggest Wabnaki history and presence. So, Joe, thank you very much. Will you give him a warm hand? Thank you, Bob. Thank you to, to all of you for being here. And actually, I should start with a longer list of acknowledgments. And first, even before this list, I want to give thanks a colleague, a friend of mine, has a wonderful way of thinking, and I'm, I'm invoking her in, in the hopes that I can actually do it as well as she does. I'd like to give thanks to the people here and before us who have made possible, at least I'll speak for myself, my opportunity to be here today. And that's a big statement, and it covers a lot. Um, but I also like that generosity of capac capacity, capaciousness, because, I mean, I had a really nice dinner. Thank you again, Jody, for that. Um, but, but, you know, cooked by, prepared by some people who I never saw. And they are part of my good fortune of being here today. Um, but I also more specifically want to acknowledge, and thank is a tricky word in this case, but I do want to acknowledge um, that we are on the homeland of Wabanaki people. And that um, I want to acknowledge that uh, the work that we're doing here tonight, listening, talking, sitting, standing, walking, is work that we're doing in a Wabanaki homeland. Um, I also want to thank a number of Wabanaki scholars who have contributed a great deal to what I think about both in terms of this talk, but in other uh, elements of my work as it relates to Wabanaki history. Uh, furthermore, um, a number of scholars, friends, colleagues who I've worked with at Bates and at other places who have responded to some of the ideas that I'll be talking about in this talk and I hope have helped me refine some of those ideas. And then I really want to make sure I thank um, you. I, I've given this talk before. I know what, this is the wrong way to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. I know what I'm talking about. But I don't mean that in the sense that I know what I'm doing, like in the sense, oh, it's all so straightforward and obvious. What I'm saying is, I've heard this talk before. <laughs> I'm not here to talk so that I can hear myself speak as much as I do enjoy hearing myself speak. <laughs> and I, so, you know, but I'm, I'm really here because you're interested in what I have to say. And I'm really here because I'm curious what things you're wondering about what I have to say. So thank you for being here, um, not because I need an audience, but because I'm curious about your curiosity. Um, so I'm looking forward to the questions, just so we're clear. But I also want to go back to my first acknowledgment. Um, to say that I am acknowledging Wabanaki on whose homelands we sit and stand at this moment raises for me a really important question, which is, what does that mean? What does it mean to acknowledge Wabanaki? 
And what does it mean to acknowledge that I am, we are, in Wabanaki homelands? And this is a hard question, because I own property in Maine. And I don't have any intention anytime soon of giving that property to Wabanaki people, as much as I actually believe that that property is part of an illegitimately acquired space that was taken from Wabanaki. So when I say I'm acknowledging that this is Wabanaki homeland, what am I really talking about? And in a sense, this talk, my conversation with you tonight, is very much rooted in that question. Um, and when I talk about having, that, that I believe that Wabanaki have many words for home, my effort to understand those many words and what home means and what homeland means as a historical fact, that is to say that Wabanaki understood their homelands in certain ways at certain times, but also as a current fact that Wabanaki continue to inhabit these homelands, for me is part of this larger question of well, what does it mean for me then to acknowledge that fact, that presence, that, that Wabanaki are part of this place still. Um, and, and that's a hard question because on a certain level, it's really easy for me as an intellectual, as, a, as an academic, as a historian, to just sort of say, well, it's complicated and I'll talk about the history, and then I go home and sleep in my bed in the house that I own with the title that says that I own it, with my wife, by the way, it's not just mine, but, but without any of that sort of, well, what's the moral question in that? And, and so on some level, a lot of what I want to do tonight is continue the thinking, because it's an ongoing process for me, about what it is to acknowledge a, a presence of Wabanaki in a place that includes my own home. Um, and I want to do that in four ways or four parts. Um, first, I want to start with some elements of local history that I wonder, I'm curious, if you will find surprising. Maybe you won't, which would actually be really helpful for me too. So first, some things about local history that I think at least might be interesting or important for us to, to start with. Second, a couple of things that I think, two things that I think we all know already about history and about Maine. Third, some things that I believe you probably don't know that I think would be worth thinking about. And in introducing those new ideas, I'm curious whether they get us to the fourth point, which is to see a little differently some of the stuff we already know. And just so you know, for me, one of the best things as a scholar, and I don't just mean a historian, I mean one of the things that I love about learning is not just learning so that like, oh, now I know more stuff. Like I used to know 10 words, now I know 20 words, now I'm twice as smart. I actually think the most important thing about learning new stuff is when those extra 10 new words don't just add to your word list, whatever that list might be, but they actually change how you think about the first 10 words or the first 10 things that you know. And so I'm actually curious if in talking about some local history, some things that you probably already know and incorporating some things that you might not know, that we can actually see some things differently, including some things that we already know. So I'll come back through this stuff. No quiz. I hope that list at least helps us get started. Um, so let's start with some things that you might already know, but maybe not, that are about Wabanaki presence. And this is really important, especially as somebody who, as Bob pointed out, is primarily interested in native history, but also of the colonial period, that is to say the 1600s and 1700s. It's very easy for me, for people who are interested in hearing what I have to say, to think like, oh, cool, we get to think about Wabanaki and talk about Wabanaki when they used to be here. And that it's a colonial history, it's a colonial event, and it's done because that time is over. And one of the things that a lot of Native scholars point out is that, in fact, colonial history began in 1492, and it went until the future because it's still going on, because it's still a colonial place. If this is a Wabanaki homeland, then it is still colonized. So we are still in the colonial period, even if that is not the term that most people think of when they think of the word colonial. Um, but what I'm saying more than anything is that one of the things that's really important for me 
again, as somebody who everybody thinks is going to be talking about stuff before 1800, is that I point out that Wabanaki history continues after 1800, including right here. And I don't necessarily mean where exactly this church is, but I do mean places very close nearby. So here's a newspaper article that I found, and this is where digital archives are fantastic because you can do all of these searches um, through newspapers by just doing keyword search. So I just looked for the word Indian in a number of uh, newspaper databases offered through um, some main archives. And one of them that I found was from Lincoln County in Rockland, uh, Rockport, excuse me, and this is Waldoboro, that basically talks about um, the arrival of Penobscots in Rockport in 1875. Now, one of the things that's, I'll read this aloud because I don't expect that people in the back of the room can, can see it. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this article, this very brief article on page three, uh, page two of the Lincoln County News from 1875, is it both makes clear that Wabanaki were present and it both makes very clear that they were present in a way that is dependent on stereotypes and upon racism that is, in a sense, simultaneously erasing them, okay? So this is a news article that is about presence and erasure at the same time. It's not a pretty read. Um, Lo, the poor Indian is in town. Times have changed since Lo meandered along the sanguinary war path, his baggage consisting for the most part of a tomahawk and some red paint. Now he gives exhibitions and his dusky person is surrounded with the clothing peculiar to the hated white man. He also travels with the latest pattern of iron-bound, zinc-covered, anti-baggage-smashing Saratogo trunk. So fades another illusion of youth. So what this newspaper article is saying in September of 1875 is that Wabanaki people have arrived in town with their very heavily protected trunks, probably filled with baskets for sale, but perhaps other items of interest for locals as part of their travels through their homeland, let's not forget, in an effort to make money. But because they're doing it in a way that does not involve war paint and tomahawks, they actually don't look like, quote unquote, real Indians, okay? But what I want to make clear is that people in Waldoboro knew native people as natives, even if they saw them, and as people who were na neighbors, that was the word I wanted to use, um, even if those neighbors were passing through, okay? And we don't have to go quite as far. Thank you, by the way, to the old Bristol Historical Society's digitized photo collection. Yeah, that's right. So, I, so this is one of those things where I was like, you know, I've been to Bristol before. I love this area. I have never visited your historical society. I just, I went to your website and I looked, did a little keyword search for Indian. Indian baskets for sale, circa 1915. Did you know that? You all right, so that's good. I would like, so did you actually put the, uh, the photos? Yes, yeah, so, all right, so there we go. So good for you. And, but here's, one of the things that I think is worth knowing is that Wabanaki people, and actually, well, let me finish the sentence and then let me give a little bit of background that I should have given at the very beginning, forgive me. Wabanaki people have been coming to this place for generations, but in a sense, it did not stop with statehood. It did not stop with the end of the French and Indian Wars or whenever else, okay? And that's really important because what I'm talking about in the rest of this talk is about a continuing relationship rather than one that died when Lo, the poor Indian with his tomahawk and red face paint died, either in the newspapers of racist newspapers, in the, in, the, in the columns of racist newspapers or in the imaginations of white newspaper writers. Um, but bracket, just for a minute, I should have given you a little bit of background and I'm sorry I forgot. What do I mean when I say Wabanaki? Wabanaki um, is a collective term for a number of peoples. It, as a Passamaquoddy language teacher, Roger Paul, has explained it to me. It comes from the Passamaquoddy, or it's related to the Passamaquoddy word, Chiku Wabunakik. Chiku Wabunakik means the place where the sun first shows their face. So Wabanaki can also be translated, or, or, and Wabanakiik is the people of the place where the sun first shows their face. So the Wabanaki are the people of the Dawnland. That is a collective term that, in, that includes 
The Mi'kmaq, here I'll gesture as if we're looking at a large map of northeastern North America. The Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. You with me here? Nova Scotia over here. Uh, the Mi'kmaq also in New Brunswick, uh, but also the Wollastigwe, also known as Maliseet of what's now New Brunswick, but also uh, northern Maine of the uh, Holton Band of Maliseet are among those groups. Uh, the Pescaramukadig, the Pesc Passamaquoddy of what's now um, eastern Maine, but also southwestern uh, uh, New Brunswick. The Penobscot of what's now uh, the Penobscot Valley and Penobscot Bay, and then also the Abenaki or Abenaki of Western Maine, uh, Northern New England, and the, the town, the Abenaki town in uh, Southern Quebec, roughly between Quebec City and Montreal. So again, five different peoples collectively known as Wabanaki, Abenaki, Pe Pe Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, uh, Wollastigwe, people of the beautiful river, the Wollastigweeg, um, as opposed to Maliseet, which basically means lazy speaker in Mi'kmaq, uh, and then the Mi'kmaq, okay? Five peoples. And that's what I'm talking about when I say Wabanaki. And one of the reasons I stopped myself is because a Penobscot uh, person I've worked with has pointed out, if Wabanaki means people of the Dawnland, then Wabanakis, and I actually forgot to correct this on one of my earlier slides, then Wabanakis is redundant. The S is not necessary. And Wabanaki people is consequently also redundant because you're saying Wabanaki people people. Just like, by the way, uh, Katahdin means Great Mountain. So Mount Katahdin is Mount Great Mountain. <laughs> so, um, so there are other ways in which these kinds of redundancies slip into English and is something I might come back to a little bit. Um, so Wabanaki have had continuing relationships to this place that did not end in 1800, okay? And one of the things that's great about this particular example, Indian baskets for sale, 1915 roughly, is that um, several years ago, I was working and talking with a Passamaquoddy elder, language keeper, political activist, community leader, Wayne Newell, who passed about a year and a half ago about place names. And we were talking about place names and history. And one of the words we talked about was Pemaquid or Bomaquad, uh, wait, Bomaquad. Um, and he was saying to me that Bomaquad means point of land going out to sea. And there are a couple of things that I want to talk about that, but later. But one of the things he also said was, my mom worked at a hotel as a chambermaid at a, in Pemaquid. And she came here with her family. He referred to it as, as her caregiver, so I don't know if it was a parent or a grandparent or someone, a relative. He, she came here with her caregiver to sell baskets. And one of the things that I think is worth thinking about, especially because Wayne Newell was fluent in Passamaquoddy, is that his mother must have been as well. He did not say that, but I don't think it needs saying. So to come to a place like Pemaquid and to know that it's actually Pomaquid and to be at a place cleaning somebody else's bedroom while they visit, a place that you know because you know because you know its meaning, is to consider a set of relationships that exist that might be kind of hinted at in Indian baskets for sale, made to order, but that really rest in a history that is generations and you might even say hundreds of generations old. And that's what I want us to remember when I'm talking about continuing, re re continuing relationships and relationships that don't end with statehood, say, or the end of the French and Indian Wars, or you pick, okay? So this is what I wanted to suggest to you as something that you might not know. And, but at the same time, that's presumptuous on my part. I don't know what you know. So, can I ask you a question? Is this surprising to you to know that Passamaquoddies and other Wabanaki would be selling baskets here a hundred years ago? So, that's surprising or not surprising? Not surprising. Okay. Well, that's good. So, did you know this or is it that you are not surprised even though you didn't know it? Okay, you're not surprised, but you didn't know it beforehand, right? Okay, all right, that's fine. And by the way, this is not like, you're a great audience because you answered the right question. I'm actually genuinely curious. I don't know, 
One of the things that's really interesting for me, especially one of the reasons why I love talking to historical societies is because you know your histories, right? And I don't mean just here, I mean every other society I've talked to, and it's always really interesting to hear what those histories are that you know, right? Um, but what I'm interested in is the ways in which some of these histories can be known and not known at the same time, or can be not known and not surprising at the same time. I grew up in Newport, Rhode Island. I grew up on Narragansett Bay. I thought Narragansett referred to a beer. <laughs> even though, even though I had also visited a shell midden when I was in middle school. So I was told there were Indians here and they were Narragansetts, and I knew that they were, they were Narragansett, there was a Narragansett Bay, but I still dreamed in the same way that F. Scott Fitzgerald does at the end of The Great Gatsby, that those first English or first European sailors to sail up the bay didn't see anybody, okay? And by the way, this is something I, now I'm kind of digressing a little bit, but if you think that doublethink is only an element of 1984 and George Orwell's dystopian world of totalitarianism, then you haven't been paying attention to how well colonial history has at least taught me to not recognize the presence of the very people I knew were there because it was in the bay that I was sailing on every day for a full summer, right? Even as I was also taught that they were there, right? That's doublethink too. And I live in a democracy, so. But what I'm getting at is, to the extent that this is surprising, it's worth asking, or to the extent that it's not something you knew, even if it's not surprising, why? Okay, and one of the things that I wanna do now is think about two things you probably, probably already know. Because I think both of these things help us understand why this is stuff that you might know but you probably don't think about, but also what that hides. And so the first thing is, this map, which, can you see this? Is the contrast good enough here? Can you see that? What's this a map of? I mean, you can read the title, of course, but what's this a map of? It's a map of Maine from 1820, right? How do you recognize? So if I covered this over, if I was like, no, don't look here, how would you know that that's a map of Maine? Coast. The coast, okay. So there's this coastline that's very clearly defined. Is that enough for you? New Hampshire border, New Hampshire border helps a lot. I find this blob that goes up to the north, even though Greenleaf didn't know where it ended, helps me as well. But here's one of the things that I think is really important to know about this kind of a map and why it's recognizable. Even, um, even at this distance, is that when you look really close, everything is marked out in carefully drawn lines. Everything is bordered. So you know, I'll go back. You know this is Maine and not just some other squiggly coast, in part because you know the coast really well. You spend a lot of time on it. But you also know this shape, and that's a shape made by lines that were carefully drawn, even if not all of them were perfectly surveyed, right? And those lines go down to the level of towns and nicely colored counties, and if this were Google and you could zoom in even further, it would go down to the property boundaries that demarcate every single piece of private property or public property that defines the territory that is now known as the state of Maine. What that means is that, or what I'm saying is, one of the things that we know, and we can define, we can debate what I mean by know, but what I'm getting at is one of the ways that we see space is in terms of carefully demarcated polygons that all individually apply to an individual or to some other entity that is the owner, right? This church is on land that is owned by the church. And that makes it very difficult to see where Wabanaki people, where Wabanaki fit, right? Because if this is Phippsburg and this is Bristol, where's Penobscot homeland? Where's the place for, in, for Passamaquoddy basket makers to claim that they have their space? Do you see what I'm saying? So that, in a sense, by marking boundaries like this, the only people who belong are the people who can actually own those spaces or politically control those spaces. And Wabanaki, having neither ownership nor control of those spaces, disappear. Or at the very least, become much more difficult to see. You cannot map them in the same way, for sure. So that's one thing that I think we kind of know, all right? The second thing that we know is that there are a lot of place names around here 
that are Wabanaki in origin. Pemaquid being one of them. Monhegan being another, out to sea island. Which, by the way, because the languages of Wabanaki are Algonquian and similar to the languages of the Leni Lenape of the lower Hudson Valley, Manhattan and Monhegan are two words for different ways for talking about islands. I don't know exactly what Manhattan means, but the Mun is, the Manahan is, is, is a word for island in both cases. Um, so you've heard other related words in other places. Um, uh, Wawanak, the place of the bays, okay? Um, Segwin, I've heard humped up island, so I don't, I mean, I think I've heard about vomiting, uh, vomit as well in terms of waves and things like that. But, but here's, I think one of the things that I th is important to recognize in these place names, I think there are two things really interesting. One of them is that even in this world that's all perfectly subdivided into parcels that are either known as states or counties or towns or properties, there is a continuing recognition on the landscape that there is a prior presence in these place names. These place names do not come from colonial peoples. But there's a second thing that's going on with place names, and this is also tricky and, in a sense, part of that erasure that's kind of like what I was showing you with the, um, the newspaper article from 1875. They reveal and they erase at the same time. Because these are place names, Pemaquid is said with an English accent or with an American English accent, not Pemaquid. Right? And it's removed from its meaning as the point of running out to sea. And this is where I want to go back to talking about language and relationships. Pemaquid is just Pemaquid. And maybe you know what it means, long out to sea point or point running out to sea. But in Passamaquoddy, and this is true with Wabanaki languages in general, much of what you're talking about is relational to you, the speaker. So for instance, there's no word for mother in the strict sense of the word mother. It's just like an abstract thing. There's my mother, there's their mother, but there's not just mother. You don't just have a mother, okay? You don't just have a hand. Those things are in relation to somebody or something else. And similarly, the word Pemaquid, Pomaquod, is actually not just the point of land running out to sea, but it's the point of land running out to sea from me. So in other words, it's a word that's said from a place like here, as opposed to at the point, which makes a lot of sense because if you're a paddler going along these shores, you don't go around Pemaquid Point unless you're really feeling like you want to do something exciting today because it's dangerous. So if you're talking about Pomaquod, you're actually talking about the portage that you're going to be taking from here to New Harbor so that you can safely pass these dangerous shores, but also get to wherever else you might be going, whether you're going into Muscungus Bay or whether you're heading if, uh, west, right? So one of the things that's missing, that's erased, so you know that you might know the word, oh, it means point of land running out to sea, but you don't know the relationships that's embedded in the language that is spoken around that word, right? The English language does not exist in Merriam-Webster's English Dictionary, it exists in the grammar and the conversations that we have that hold that language together, right? So place names similarly both reveal a Wabanaki presence and also erase the relationships that make that presence real. Do you see what I'm saying? So two things that I think are really important that you already know is that, that land is divided in ways that erase Wabanaki and place names acknowledge a certain extent of a Wabanaki presence, but also would in a sense do a very good job of erasing it further in a different way, erasing the relationships that make that Wabanaki presence meaningful, right? Okay, so let's go to some other stuff that I think might help us see things differently, some new ideas that I've been thinking about. And this is where I beg your indulgence or your forgiveness or whatever it is that you were looking forward to when you, when you came here tonight to like, oh, he's going to talk about Pemaquid history. I'm not. You've heard it all. What I'm going to tell, talk to you about is how what I know from other places further west might help you understand the history that you know here better. Okay? And maybe you can tell me some of that so that I know Pemaquid history better as a result, too. 
Um, but here's what I mean. Here's another map. So let me start with this map. Do you know what this is a map of? And for those of you who read French, okay, you can cheat and read that. But, but where, is, where is this map? Gaspé. Where do you see Gaspé? Because, yeah, I mean, you're right, Gaspé is there. So if you see Gaspé kind of here, there's the Gaspé Peninsula, there's the, there it is, the uh, Fleuve Saint de Saint Laurent. Okay, so St. Lawrence River. Okay, so it's northeastern Canada, but right here smack in the middle, that's Maine. Now, of course, the coast isn't as nicely done, right? Moses Greenleaf had better surveying work done. But here's one of the things that I think is really interesting and really disorienting about this map. This is an excellent map of Maine from 1715, but the reason is not because it's an outstanding re rendition of the coast, it's an outstanding rendition of Wabanaki places and place names and travel routes. And what's more important about that is that this map is an excellent, I mean, by colonial standards, don't get me wrong, Wabanaki could have done it better. But this is an excellent rendition by colonial standards or it's a glimpse of Wabanaki relationships to place. And so, for instance, here's Pemquit, <coughs> Pem, Pemequit, so Pemquid, right there. Um, and this is Riviere de Saint-Georges, Saint so um, the St. George River. Song, oh, let's see, Song de Ronc, Sagadahawk, so the mouth of the Kennebec River. Um, See, Bombeck is, is uh, Shabig Island. Casque Bay, Casco Bay, but it's actually a fort at Casco. But what's going on in this French Jesuit map of what we call Maine, and by the way, if you're curious about this, I can send you the web link. It's a fun, like, if you like looking at stuff, if you like looking at maps, it's a fascinating map. But here's what I find really interesting about this map, and I'll go into it more in a bit. These little dotted lines here, here, not the red one, that's a, that's a compass rose line. Um, but this line here, and then there's another one up at the top left that you can see a little bit of. Those are portages. So in other words, one of the things that this map is doing is showing, so here's a Jesuit. How does the Jesuit move, move around? What is he doing there? He's moving around with Wabanaki people. Because he's, like, the only way he's going to get them to convert to Catholicism is if he hangs out with them. And he doesn't, they don't hang out in the same place. He has to move with them. So what does this mean? This is a map, and I'm going to go backwards for a second. This is a map that shows you how you live in Chku Wabanakik, the land where the sun first shows their face. Which is to say, you move around on rivers and you move around on portages. Which is why there aren't a lot of lines. Even though this is a map, about the lands of, uh, between France and England, okay? So it's very much about borders as far as the French are concerned at some level. But what this map by this Jesuit priest is really showing us is a glimpse of the ways that Wabanaki move through space and in a sense the way that Wabanaki live at home. Um, and let me shift gears to show you a different way of thinking about this. I'm a historian. I love documents. You may have heard from your parents when you asked them if you had more than, if you were more than an only child, if you ever asked them, who do you love best? And your parents said, we love you all equally. And you doubted. I just want to let you know that in the family of the documents that I know, this is my favorite document. <laughs> okay? And the reason is because it does wonderful things. I learn wonderful things from Pierre Paul, um, Pierre Paul, Peter Paul in French, okay? Um, in 1793, he was asked to testify on behalf of two different disputants over land disputes on the Androscoggin River. This is actually basically about, was my home in Auburn part of a land sale from 1684? I'm not gonna go into that. But as part of the testimony, one of the things that they were trying to figure out was, well, in that old deed, they mentioned different falls as the border for the end, end of the land sale. Where was that border? Where were those falls? So basically, they asked this man in 1793, what are, what are the names for all of your places along the river? And this is what he said. And I will read it just for, in case you can't from where you're sitting. 
I, Perpol of lawful age, testify and say that the Indian name of the river was Pajepskuk. Actually, I'm going to read it here so I could speak to you all. From Kwabakuk, what is now called Merry Meeting Bay, up as far as Amat Ganpantuk, what the English calls Harris's Falls. And all the river from Harris's Falls up was called Amaskongan, and the largest falls on the river above Rockamakuk, about 12 miles. And them falls have got three pitches, and there is no other falls on the river like them, and the Indians used to catch the most salmon at the foot of them falls. And the Indians used to say when they went down the river from Rockamakuk, and when they got down over the falls by Harris's, they say, now come Pajepskuk. And just so, and by the way, the text that I'm taking here is this first half, and then Pear Pole is signing the document with his moose glyph right there in the middle. Um, I've highlighted all of the words that are Wabanaki place names. Um, and you can see those places here on this map. So here's Quabacook, Pajepskook, which is now at Brunswick. And if you've been between Brunswick and Topsom on, the, on Route 201 there, Pajepskook is underneath the dam that you see there. Um, I'm at Gonpuntuk, uh, which is Lewiston, Auburn, Great Falls. Amaskongan basically is the river above Emmet Gonpuntuk. Rockamacook, which is at J, um, oh, Canton Point, if you know where that is, along the banks of the Androscoggin. And I'll explain this more in a little bit. And then above them were the, the falls with three pitches. That's Rumford Falls. Okay. So here's what I think is fascinating about. Here's why I love this document. First, which direction is he going as he goes, as he describes all of this? Quabacook, Pajepskook, I'm at Gonpantuk, I'm He's going upriver. And which way is he going when he says the other way? Whew, downriver, because he only has to mention two things. He goes by Harris's Falls and now comes Pajepskook. Right? So the document itself captures a certain element of the movement that is part of what he's describing in the document. Right? So there's a way in which there's a relationship just in the way it is written or the way it is presented because he didn't write it. He was speaking and it was written down. Um, but there's a way in which he's telling the story of movement upriver and movement downriver and the ways that those things happen. And, you, you know, like, watch out for Harris's Falls because here comes Pajepskook. So that's one. Two, the place names. What's going on with these place names? I'm going to go back to this map. Excuse me. Quabacook. Insert probably before every time I say means, okay? Because all of these translations are probably true. I don't speak Wabanaki languages. I've learned a little. I've learned enough to know that a lot of place name work has involved some really good guesswork and some really shoddy guesswork. And people can get pretty sloppy because there aren't a lot of people around to correct them. If I said to you, I'm going to tell you about the meanings, so I lived in Spain for a while, and if I told you, oh, here are the ne meanings of all these place names, but I don't really speak Spanish, I'd be very careful about where I gave that talk, right? Um, so probably, Quabacook probably refers to uh, waterfowl and to the place where there are lots of waterfowl, which is going to happen quite common when waterfowl molt on a big estuary like Merry Meeting Bay. There's going to be a moment every time of year when they can't fly because their feathers are off. And so you can herd them up. And this is a description from the 1720s where uh, a Jesuit describes Wabanaki basically canoeing, gathering up a whole bunch of waterfowl, ducks, swans, geese into one part of a cove and then killing a large number of them so that they could eat them. Okay. So Quabacook is about waterfowl, food. Pajepskook is about the long rocky rapids part. Uh, the falls that are right there, which is a fantastic place to catch salmon in the springtime at the spring runs. I'm at Gonpontok actually, and I'm pretty sure of this because somebody who speaks a Beneke has translated as such, uh, the place where you catch and dry fish at the falls. Amaskongan is the place of many fish. Rakamikuk is probably related to the Passamaquoddy word Wulagmige, Wulagmige, uh, the good ground, which is probably for hoeing, planting, and in fact, Canton Point is one of those places where the Androscoggin River floods um, over a big uh, bend in the river and makes for excellent recurring annually fertilized alluvial soils for farming. That doesn't require a lot of turning of earth because the soil is loose, right? So good ground. And then, of course, you've got the falls furthest up above Rumford Falls, the best place to catch salmon. What has 
Per Paul Dunn, he has described the Androscoggin River in terms of all of the different places where you can relate to gathering food and surviving as a Wabanaki person at home along the entire river. So when I talk about or when I hear about Wabanaki place names, one of the things that at least in, a, in an instance like this is that somebody like Per Paul or Pial Paul um, is articulating not just names and meanings, but he's also articulating relationships. And these are relationships that are not just, oh, we like to live here, or oh, we like to go there, but these are the places that sustain us, and this is how they sustain us, okay? So just to go back for a moment to this map, while all of the place names on this map are not about food, they are all in a sense part of a web, if you will, of relationships which is another reason why it's hard to see this, because this web is invisible in Moses Greenleaf's map. This is a totally different kind of depiction of space. It's not wrong, it's just dramatically different, okay? And that kind of dramatic different space does not allow for a world that is described in the ways that P.L. Pohl describes them, okay? All right, so what? Um, what do you do with this? I, this is where I say, oh, and this is why, this is what a land acknowledgement means, and you're like, oh, now I get it. Um, I still don't know. Uh, but here's one of the things that I think is really important to consider. If place names are part of the many ways that Wabanaki describe home, and that all of them are part of home in different ways at different times of the year or even at different times in history. So what Pomakwod means to Wayne Newell's mother is different from what it means to Wayne Newell's children. And it is also going to be different from what it meant to people like Pial Pol or their, his ancestors, right? So that like what Pemaquid is, is different now. And so that meaning is going to change in that respect. Um, what it means to talk about Pemaquid? Well, there are a lot of people who have white, you know, a lot of white people who have houses there now. You can't do what you used to do, say, 300 years ago. But it's still a place that we know. Maybe to sell baskets now, but it's still a place that's ours, part of our homeland. And I think that that relationship means that it's worth remembering that just because the map and I include Google Maps with this because they look a lot like Moses Greenleaf's maps. Just because the map says that Wabanaki people aren't there or there's no room for them does not mean that it shows you everything that you need to know about that space and about people living in that space and about people's relationships to that space. So that's one thing. But the other thing is that it then makes clearer how it is that Wabanaki continue To claim, to make, to rebuild connections to place. So these are two websites from two organizations that have worked with or are run by Wabanaki people. Wabanaki. So the first in the top left is the Bamazine Land Trust, to whom uh, the honorarium that you were kind enough to offer me is going to go as a donation. So thank you and thank them. Because the Bamazine Land Trust is an organization uh, created by uh, Abenaki or Abenaki, depends on your, how you want to pronounce it, and Penobscot people who have ancestral ties to the Kennebec Valley and who wish to reconstitute those ties in ways that basically make sense to Moses Greenleaf's map makers by buying lands as a land trust that they can use to reconstitute relationships to those places. Okay? Um, and also to do it through education and other pro practices that don't necessarily involve buying property because you can't buy up all the property. It's just not likely anyway, at least not soon. Um, so, but they're doing it because these are relationships that they didn't just wake up one day and think, oh my gosh, you know, 500 years ago we used to have this land, now we should have it again. It's that these are, these are products of, this organization is the product of ongoing relationships that are manifesting themselves in different ways. And when I said to you that Bomakwod means something different in 2023 than it did, say, in 1915, or than it did in, say, 1715, this is another way that I'm talking about it. 
Wabanaki in a space where there is no reservation are using the language of land trusts to reestablish or to reaffirm connections that they've already believed they have, okay? So that's one. And another, First Light, First Light Learning Journey is actually an organization run by white people um, that started primarily to help white people figure out how they could work better with Wabanaki. And what that has turned into, among other things, is a project that is both working to train mostly white traditional land trusts and land organizations to work with Wabanaki in a way that's actually respectful towards Wabanaki as opposed to just showing up to Wabanaki and saying, hey, you know, we did this land acknowledgement and we want you to say that it's okay. What do you think? Can you, do you want to come visit and take some sweet grass while you're visiting? And instead, First Light working with Wabanaki and particularly a commission that the Wabanaki formed, the Wabanaki Commission on, on Land and Stewardship, this organization is looking to figure out how do we set the agenda for what it is that non-native land trusts do in collaboration with native people. And that work of collaboration is something that First Light has helped develop, but it is doing it in conversation and consultation with Wabanaki. Both of these organizations are doing work now building on generations of Passamaquoddy, Penobscot, Mi'kmaq, Maliseet efforts to maintain relationships with their homelands. And so when I think about land acknowledgements, one of the things that I'm thinking about is not just what happened in the past as a historian, but how does that shape what happens in terms of the relationships, not only that they have, but also that I have with Wabanaki as a way to, I hope, support some of the work that they do. And with that, I say, thank you very much. And then I say, what kinds of questions do you have? Because I'm curious, honestly, what is it that you know that would make this more of a Pemaquid history talk? Or that helps, would help you think further about whatever it is you want to think about? Yes. I'm just about um, your message. And I'm wondering if um, we are, your observation about the names isn't really about the English. Uh, for example, um, in Gaelic, Aber means confluence. So Aberdeen is the confluence of the Dean and the North Sea. Hmm. In Wales, Aberystwyth is, which took me three days to uh, pronounce, <laughs> uh, Aberystwyth is the confluence of the uh, Irish Sea and the Ristwith River. In other places, the place Southampton is an Anglo-Saxon word that, which is a composite of different things, but it means basically it's a town with a fence around it in Anglo-Saxon. Mm -hmm. So um, it seems to me that the English uh, were used to adopting previous civilizations' name places. And they did that in Maine, mm -hmm. or Massachusetts, or New England in particular. Right. Um, so, is, does that, those facts, do it have any import to your theories and so forth? What, what, what's your reaction to that? Thank you. I, that's a wonderful question. Um, place names. The act of place naming didn't begin with colonization. It has a long and rich and complicated history in. The British Isles as well, and certainly anywhere, right? So I'm trying to trying to I, I'm thinking about five different things, none of them particularly coherently, because I, I find there's a lot to think about in your question. So let me try it this way. The English practice of place naming, including in places like Ireland, and I was just talking with somebody who's um, so I was talking recently with Connor Quinn, who is a linguist at the University of Southern Maine and is one of the foremost speakers of Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, and other Wabanaki languages, and in fact is a, an educator who has worked with Wabanaki to improve their language education process. 
But one of the things he's also, like, he became a linguist because at age 11, he decided he wanted to learn Gaelic because he was of Irish ancestry, and he wanted to learn his ancestral home language. So he's, he's a linguist of not just Wabanaki languages, but also of Irish, Gaelic Irish, uh, Mandarin, Indonesian. He actually said Mandarin and Indonesian are my two best languages. But, um, but then he goes on to talk about a number of other languages that he works in. Long digression to say that he has thought a lot about place names and the ways that, in fact, when the British colonized Ireland, they actually incorporated most Irish place names into the British mapping of Ireland. So in other words, yeah, there are very few English names in Ireland for places in Ireland. And that's extraordinary if you think about it too. Massachusetts as a place name? Like, come on, people. Like, you get to call it whatever you want and you pick this really long word, right? And, and so why is that? And I think there are a couple of reasons, one of which he helped me understand in terms of Ireland. It's a way of colonizing. Because what does it do? It decontextualizes the word. Aberdeen just means Aberdeen if you're an English speaker. It's just a funny string of syllables. And so now it has lost that connection to the, the actual meaning and, in a sense, the relationships that are behind the word, right? Pemaquid is just Pemaquid. And similarly, you have that with all of these other places. But there's another layer to it as well that I think is really interesting to notice. Place names in Maine that tend to be indigenous tend to have to do with water. Monhegan is an island. Pemaquid is a peninsula. The Androscoggin, well, that's a mixed up word. Like Edmund Andros was a governor and it got mixed up with Amoscoggin. But the thing is that Kennebec, Penobscot, all of the major rivers in Maine are indigenous names and not, say, the Charles River in Boston. Okay? Why? I think a lot of it has to do with Wabanaki people are talking with English colonists, co explorers, and they're like, what's that? It's Monhegan. Oh, okay. So some of what's going on is there are ways in which the English are, because they're learning the space and they want to make sure they're navigating properly and their best guides for navigating are the people who speak the language of the place, the next time they come around, if they say, oh, we're, we want to visit the Charles River, say in Massachusetts, outside of Boston, any Massachusetts would say, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. But if you say, if you're in this area, for instance, I don't know, trying to think, uh, uh, Casco. Is it helpful to say Casco? Well, yeah, because that's the place of the Blue Heron, and now I know where you're going. Let's go that way. But if you say, I want to go to Falmouth, which is the original name for Portland, where? So, in other words, places that are going to be navigationally useful are probably going to end up in Wabanaki words. Places that are going to be useful for the English, York, Wells, Falmouth, Brunswick, they're all, na they're all named after English things and people and places. So I think one of the things that's going on is you see the layers of, if you will, history and conversation in those things. But I'm not sure if I've gotten to where you were going with your question because I really appreciated the first part of your question, which is to say, I'm not sure if I'm making the point that, that I want to be making. Did I get there? Well, I, I, just to carry one one a little bit further. Yeah. Um, Aberdeen was populated by the Dorks. Who ever heard of the Dorks? But they're the original people of Scotland. But nobody cares about them. They they're still live there. Right. But nobody cares that Aberdeen is named Aberdeen or whatever it might be named. Um, so I'm not quite sure. Uh, do we need to care about Pemaquid being named Pemaquid? Yes, right. And being a homeland of the Wabanaki? Yes, okay. Yeah, so this is the big so what question, kind of, right? Or a big, not the, but a. Stimulated. Yeah, for sure. Okay, um, let me try it a different way. I'm pretty sure a few of you know that Boston is an abbreviation of St. Botolph's Town. I didn't know that until a friend of mine told me because he lives on St. Butthoff Street in Boston. Who, who, like, okay. But that doesn't make Boston feel any less familiar as a place. And I'm going to use the word we in a very specific way because it's ours, right? It's Boston. 
it's comfortable, it's there, right? And there's a way in which Boston, even when it's separated from its longer, its older sort of deeper meaning, still feels like home because it's a place that we know in the, on the terms that we want. And when I say we, who am I talking about? I guess what I'm talking about is the people who have the power to name that place and feel like it belongs to them. I mean colonial people. And so, even though you forget the meaning of St. Botolph's Town, and you just say Boston, or even if you forget that Falmouth... No, I, so, um, oh goodness, uh, Tad Baker, Emerson Baker is coming here. So, he wrote a wonderful article, and I've only remembered the half of it, but I'm going to try the first, the half that I know. Um, towns of York, Falmouth... Um, forgetting Scarborough, are actually all named after towns in England, as you probably might imagine. But they're named for places where either the Royalists or the Puritans won battles against each other, and then they put those names on the places with, that they actually colonized in Maine. So in a way, like some of those English-sounding town names on the coast of Maine are actually vestiges of really bitter fighting that was going on in the middle 1600s in England. I didn't know that. I can't even remember it. And I read the article. But the point is that, but the point is that those things matter at those times. And then in a sense, over time, they don't matter. But what does matter is it's still ours, whoever the we are. So while I am not the descendants of Puritans, most of my ancestors came from Ireland. I have a few. The Halls came from England, but not until the 1800s. One of the things that's still, it's like, this feels comfortable. It feels like space that I know. And this is where I think place names become really important, like any name. If it's the name that you feel you possess, that you like, this belongs to your people, even if you don't know the meaning of that word, it still, in a sense, invokes a certain kind of comfort and a certain kind of belonging that does not exist if you have to be talking about, if you had to, from now on, not say Pemaquid, but you had to say Bomagwod. Or, and I'm not even saying, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it right, because the stress is on the first syllable and a slight lilt up on the last one. Bomakwod, right? Does that feel comfortable? Well, it doesn't, it's not the same rhythm as English. So that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about, is in a sense, the sense of the comfort, and that comfort, in a sense, makes you feel like there's nothing to ask a question about. And that not needing to ask a question means that you don't have to ask hard questions and in a sense, ex investigate, if I may go back, the double think that's involved in so much of the history that we inhabit. Um, I saw two hands in the back, yes, in the orange shirt, and then behind him. Yeah, Jim, go. I just want to add something. I was, I was born in Poland, and when the Germans invaded Poland, and of course within once they conquered Poland, they changed all the names into Teutonic German names. When they left, the Russians liberated Poland. And of course the names were back to the original. So, it's called, in geography, it's called sequel occupants. It might has the right to change anything they want. And a perfect example, which was a very narrow temple zone, it's all we see it here with the British and the French. The French, by the way, used the seniorial system. That's why you saw the pattern in that first map. Mm -hmm. Everybody had access to the St. Lawrence River. Right. But your, your uh, speech has a lot of meaning to me in terms of names and changing the names. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yes? Um, I'm finding this very fascinating. I guess the big question, though, that comes to mind, and it's been already touched upon by some of the people who are in the audience uh, as well, is the issue of what do we do with all this insight in order to um, educate the educators and then the educators push for the realization of the priority to instill some of this important historical perspective into the younger folks because um, we all know that when you're out starting to make your almighty dollar, all of this doesn't matter to most of that population. So, what to do? So, on, on one really basic level, I hope that this talk 
makes you not just less surprised, but more informed about the ways that Wabanaki are still here. That's a pretty low bar. That is to say, I hope you realize Wabanaki are still here. And so I was, I have, a, I taught a Wabanaki history class that Bob mentioned that I took. So part of the class is we visit Wabanaki communities. And part of the point of visiting Wabanaki communities is to talk to Wabanaki educators as opposed to just have me be the like, I know stuff, I'm a white guy and I've read stuff and you should learn this stuff and now you know it and write a paper, A plus, A, B minus, whatever. Um, so in visiting Wabanaki communities, one of the things the students realize is, oh, wow, like they actually have houses. I mean, I knew that, but at the same time, I didn't know that, right? And um, so, and as one of the Wabanaki educators who has actually, and I'm, this is actually related to the second part of your question, related to educators, one of the Wabanaki educators we met with said, you know, I want you to know that Wabanaki still exist and we use cell phones. <laughs> And, and that's like, yeah, it's funny, but at the same time, it's like, oh yeah, right, I knew that. Um, because the double think is that no, actually, 1875, we should all, like, Wabanaki should still be running around with tomahawks and red paint, right? And if they're not, then they're not really Indians. Um, so that's the first thing. But what does this mean for educators? That there's a lot of work to do. Because I, I have two sons, both are in or just graduated from college. Both of them went to school at, in the Auburn public school system. I think they got fantastic educations. Their education as it came to Wabanaki history was decidedly spotty. And it really depended on the teacher that they had in whatever grade was supposed to be their Wabanaki, Wabanaki education year, which is fourth grade and eighth grade as far as I understood it. And there's a lot of work to do because First of all, the law that requires Wabanaki studies to be taught in Maine public schools has no funding, so therefore whatever Wabanaki education teachers have gotten has been kind of on their own dime and not in any kind of mandated way. So there's a lot of work to do. But the same woman who was talking to my students about the fact that Wabanaki still exist and use cell phones has been working really closely with the Portland School Department and particularly with one um, person in the Portland School Department, uh, Fiona Hopper, to develop a K through 12 educational program that is actually a consistently like all 13 grades and not just, you know, in the fall of your fourth grade year and maybe sometime at the very, like the first week of eighth grade, you'll learn about Wabanaki in wigwams, and then it's over, because we've got to get to George Washington, um, that, that there is in fact something that is a consistent sort of curriculum. And furthermore, it's been done in consultation with a number of Wabanaki educators, so that, so that there is the capacity for teachers who I think, I mean, elementary school teacher, I talked a lot with the, the teachers of my two sons. Teachers are incredibly committed people who really want to make their students smarter, better prepared, more civically minded people. But if they don't know what they don't know, then they're not going to be able to do a lot. But I think providing these kinds of resources is going to be a critical step for enabling them to do the kind of work they've been wanting to doing, wanting to do for a long time, but they haven't taken the time. You could say that's their fault, maybe it's not, um, to actually do. So that's, I think that's coming, or it's, it's not coming. It's, it's been coming, it's been happening, but I really think that there's some big hope in the next few years, and I mean like two or three, to see some really important new resources available for a lot of teachers, not just in Portland, because I think it's gonna be shared widely. Um, the third thing, because I think you raised a really important so what question, which is like, yeah, this is all really useful, but when you educate these people and then you say, you gotta get a job, and by the way, the job is not gonna be teaching other people about Wabanaki, how are they gonna make money, and in what way is this gonna matter for Wabanaki people? Because they're going to be making money probably from a system that is still continuing colonial relationships. Let's be honest. I still am. Bates College is paying my salary and I, their money is not coming from some relationship that they've worked out with Wabanaki that decolonizes the campus. So what? Um, everybody who is 18 years and older and as a citizen of this country votes, and I don't care whether they make $5 an hour or $5 million an hour, and those votes make differences 
in terms of who gets elected to do things like decide whether Wabanaki are entitled to be recognized by the same laws that the federal government passes for every other native tribe. Just as a for instance. That requires education and it requires political will. And that doesn't require a job. It just requires those first two things. So one of the things that I think matters is not so much, well, what does this mean in terms of economics? Although I do think that there are some other ways to think about that too, because I think your point is a good one. I do think that there are some ways to think about it in terms of politics that are about, and this is where I offer you a land acknowledgement and a question. That is to say, Wabanaki are still here. So what? And I, like, I'm not saying to you, go out and vote all the people out who voted one way or another on the recent bill to um, allow federal laws to apply to Wabanaki people. I can tell you what I think, and if you want, I'll go into more detail. But the point is not that. I don't want to get distracted by who's right and who's wrong. I want you to pay attention to the fact that when you know stuff, what do you do with what you know? And that's, what, that's one way to think about it that doesn't have to do with what's your job. Does that help as, a, as an answer? Yeah. Yes. What you're sharing is that with the people who are native to a place, they tend to establish names that really have meaning in terms of what happens with that specific place. Like, is that this place that is, you know, where you start your portage from here to there? Is this where you can find your, you know, abundant amount of salmon? So where the, where the names are more of a descriptor, identify what's specific about that river or specific about that place. You know, like the land of the early egg or something where um, nesting birds tend to flock first. Mm -hmm. So that it's tied more to um, survival of the people who are trying to exist within that area versus just establishing something that represents a name that's historically familiar to others who have now come to that land for something that they feel is convenient and easily remembered. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I would draw as an analogy is, you know, with the daylight savings time, keep it or lose it. You know, the Wabanaki need first light. It's really one of the challenges that we have, especially those of us who are year-round, where we lose the light first as well. So it speaks to um, a type of existence and a relationship within that name. Mm -hmm. And what I always find to be interesting is that we also have the opportunity to live on the Hudson River. And what is so unsettling is that every year, so many people lose their lives on that river because they don't realize that it's the river that flows two ways and that people will, you know, make a decision they're going to go kayaking or they're going to go swimming. But if, you know, we've had a lot of rain, you know, part of the river comes from north to south, another part continues to move from south to north. And if it had the name that belonged to the river that spoke to the fact that it is inherently dangerous and more dangerous sometimes of the year than others, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have people losing their lives. They, they, it's like oh, the almighty Hudson, you know, majestic Hudson. They don't realize the risk they're taking as soon as they make a decision to put the toe in that water. Mm -hmm. But if it had its original name, people would be like, oh no, what does it mean about this river that's flowing two ways? You know, do I need to pay attention to that? So I feel like there's a benefit from the names for the people who are dependent on that name for thriving or surviving. There's no question that when, regardless of a name, the more you actually have to, in a sense, relate to a place through your own work, through your own experiences, you have a different relationship to that place. So if you, for instance, if you walk somewhere, it's totally different in terms of your relationship to that place than if you drive there. 
if, you, if, you, if you're stepping into the Hudson River and you actually have spent time looking at it, you're going to know, even if you don't know the, the river that flows two ways as its, its Lenny Lenape name, you're going to know it's a little more dangerous than just your swimming pool or something like that. But one of the things that you're also getting at is that place names are markers of those kinds of relationships. Now, I don't, I mean, I think it would probably save a few lives, but I'm pretty sure if you called the river the river that flows two ways and, and called it that in English, that people would still not think that it matters quite as much and they would probably still <laughs> do some things that they shouldn't be doing in the river and, and, and perhaps lose their lives. I, I mean, it would probably affect it in some ways or others because what I think really matters is not so much the names as the relationships to those names. So what exactly is the relationship that's embedded in a particular name? And just as a for instance, and I'll just take it here, so Pemaquid. I don't know how many of you live here year round. I don't know how many of you are visiting here just for the week or what. But I'm pretty sure that when you say that word, either here or somewhere else, just say that to yourself quietly right now in your own mind. You have a whole host of relationships that wrap up in that word. And maybe they wrap up around the, the idea of the point of land running out to sea. They probably, they might include that from now on, but they probably include a lot of other things that have to do with you. And the things that you know, and the things that you've experienced. And whether that place name is Pemaquid or Pomaquid, those things are still going to be true. And one of the things that I'm getting at, as much as we need to rem remember what these places really mean, because that is true, I am trying to say that, they do have meanings, and one of the reasons I want you to know that is because that means they also have histories and relationships that are embedded in those meanings. Don't forget that. But the other reason I want to bring that up is because it suggests that there are other ways to see places that are not just yours. Your way of seeing Pemaquid is not wrong. It's probably beautiful in some ways, but it's also hiding some other ways that other people see this place. And you can't see everything. Let me be clear about that. I'm not trying to say everybody needs to see everything all at once. And I still haven't seen that movie. Um, but I've heard. Um, so, but what I, what I do think is that when you know that there's more than just your way to see a place, it might save your life. But it also might help you relate to other people who you don't think belong there a little bit better because maybe they might belong there more than you think. Hang on, just because you've already asked a question, I want to make sure if anybody else hasn't asked a question, because, yes, go ahead. This was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I learned, I didn't know the kind of meant land running out to sea. That, that's a, wow, well, I've been coming here my whole life, and I didn't know that. Um, and you pronounced it differently. So, I'm... When I say it, I'm seeing the Passamaquoddy spelling, which is P-O-M-O-Q-O-T. But the way that you would, the O in Passamaquoddy is kind of like a schwa. So it's not really a pomaquod, okay, because there's no O sound in Passamaquoddy. So it's really more like pomaquod, pomaquod. And the P and the T are interchangeable with other sounds like B and D. So... I, I'm, forgive me, like, I'm talking to you as if I know stuff that I, like, there are toddlers who would know more of Passamaquoddy than I know of Passamaquoddy, just so we're clear, okay? Um, but when, and I'm not, uh, and as I said earlier, the, the stress is on the third to last syllable in most Wabanaki languages, which is why I sometimes say Abenaki. Um, so, Pomakwod, not Pomakwod, or Pom, pom okay? So, Pomakwod, if that helps. Thank you. You're welcome. So, you had a question earlier, uh, or again? Observation. Okay. Observation is, uh, with the exception, very few exceptions, the totem poles of the Northwest, Mayan, and Cherokee Nation, all of these names have become uh, permanent because of because the Indians had oral they, none of them have written with the exception that I made so they've come into permanent usage by European uh, 
writers and uh, misspellers, <laughs> what have you. And right. They, they use their own uh, ears to project these things when we look at them today. Right. Which is one reason why it's really important to say probably in front of a lot of definitions. Because I'm guessing most of you, maybe all of you, have played the game telephone as children. You know, like you whisper one word to the next person and then by the end it's totally unrecognizable from what it started, especially if we did it in this room or something like that. So, um, think about the game of telephone that involves a speaker of one language, another speaker who doesn't speak that language at all. Oh, and by the way, their, lex their sort of spelling system, it's a little bit kind of fuzzy. Sort of like, well, the English didn't really have a, a standardized spelling system for another 150 or 200 years. And by the way, a lot of them weren't great at writing anyway, so even the same word they would sometimes spell in multiple ways. So now you've got basically, you're making sounds I usually haven't heard before. I don't know what you're saying, but I'm going to write it down like this, but... I'm not really sure that's how I'm going to say it the next time or write it the next time. And by the way, the next person who hears it from me or maybe reads this is going to write it down yet another way. So then you've got this really long string of representations that are perhaps going to garble all sorts of words in all sorts of ways. So yeah, you want to be really careful with the games that you play. And I do mean games because sometimes I think a lot of early place name studiers that is to say, colonial people were like, oh, this is kind of fun. I'm going to just like, hey, this means this and this means that. And let's see how many names we can get. And believe me, I'm tempted because that map that I showed you were earlier is one that I've worked on. This is part of a larger web map of place names of Western Maine that I've worked on. And, and it's really kind of exciting to add more places to the map. But I'm always really worried, especially because I'm not a linguist, especially because I don't speak Wabanaki, that I'm just playing with Good old, the old lepidopterists who took their butterflies and stuck a pin in them and put them on a cork board and said they knew butterflies. That's what I'm afraid I'm doing. And that's dangerous because Wabanaki and Wabanaki place names are about relationships and both of those things are about life. And we're not just playing games. Right? These are people we're talking about, and people who's relating, who are relating to their home, not just any old place. Jeff? Oh, oh yes. Maybe one last question? Well, about, Go ahead. About um, 70 to 80 years ago, I attended a three-room um, schoolhouse in New Harbor. Uh-huh. And the name of the school was Mabushin. Uh-huh. And it's rather sad commentary that I never heard any discussion of the meaning of the name. That's interesting. So I've heard it, well, I've never heard it pronounced. So you, you pronounced it Mavushan? Mavushan. Yeah. So, I've, so I've, it's spelled, and when I've seen it, M-A-W-O-O-S-H-E-N. So I've always just heard it in my head as Mavushan. But it refers to the confederacy of peoples who inhabited most of what's now coastal Maine, but perhaps as far south as Salem-ish, maybe? I'm crossing my fingers behind my back, um, to roughly what is now Acadia, Mount Desert Island. And those peoples were part of a confederacy of, of, of communities uh, who saw themselves as distinct, but also saw themselves as interrelated. And that collective was known as Mavushan. So that's where that comes from. And it was roughly the late 1500s, early 1600s. Yeah. But it's interesting that no discussion on the meaning. And that tells you something about the ways that place names become, oh, Mavushan means school, right? That's all, and it's totally divorced from yeah. the histories and the peoples for whom it actually had a meaning. Yeah. I was just going to comment um, that um, the, there's so much good work being done right now with Wabanaki and, and making people aware of the Native American heritage of Maine. And it seems it's, it's, it's time for that and it's well timed. And what I was going to say is that um, a generation ago, um, people in Bristol were much more aware of the Native American presence hmm. because, as you say, you mentioned your friend whose mother came to work here in a hotel. Right. So there were more Native Americans who came and sold their wares here. So Even a generation ago? Yes. So my so. father would know that. And there are people. 
I don't know if there are people here tonight who remember that. Right. But that's gone now mm -hmm. for the most part. And about the only presence we have is during the Elvis season where people, Native Americans, do still come right. to fish in that's the great. River. Yep. But, um, you know, this is, this is good that we're oh. becoming much more aware and that there are new efforts being made. That's great. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, I would be very happy to continue talking with anybody who'd like to talk, and I would also be totally understanding if you want to do something else right now. So, um, including maybe get outside where it might be cooler. So, um, thank you all very much for your time. <laughs>